wholesome family fun. Guys, in terms of uh, today, we're going to be continuing chapter three. After we get through chapter three, we're going to be doing our first test. Sir, that look on your face, that's how I feel today. It's Monday. Uh, but we're going to try to, to make today worth your while. So I'll, I'll try to meet you in the middle, guys, with uh, some enthusiasm and exchange for some enthusiasm. Guys, how many of you, by show of hands, do not currently have Lockdown Browser on your computer? Fear not, because I sent you a link. If you would download it and install it, we're going to be using it for our first test. I'm anticipating we'll probably be doing our test sometime next week, probably Monday or Wednesday. Um, got to get it in before the midterm, guys, because we've got to have something to grade you on. So sorry about that. Um, the, the midterm grade is going to be based on the test. It's also going to be based on the homework up till now. You guys remember we had a, a guest speaker come in a couple weeks ago, two guest speakers from the Center for Community Action. We're going to start doing some scheduling here, guys, to get you guys in. Attention up front, please, guys. We're going to be doing some scheduling here in the next couple of days to get you in, working with our U Work project, which is the community uh, community outreach we're going to be doing as part of this class. I'll be giving you some details in the coming classes or two because I know people have complex schedules. We are going to work with your schedule. If you cannot travel to Altoona, we will have work you can do here as well. All will be revealed. Guys, to, to also give you a reminder, your next assignment is due on the 7th. And I'm going to be asking you to tell me about a situation when somebody would require some kind of religious accommodation. We talked on Friday a little bit about faiths, for example, who might require this. What's, what's the most obvious example of someone who might need religious accommodation in the workplace? What might be an example of somebody who has to have their work working conditions modified based on religious requirement? Yes. No, you're absolutely correct. So, so somebody, for example, whose religion requires them to be covered at all times might not be able to wear a short sleeve polo shirt. Absolutely, yes. In particular, what faith are we talking about? Yeah, people who practice Islam. For example, uh, one of the requirements too, I'm, I'm no religious scholar, but generally speaking, somebody who is a, a practitioner of Islam would also need a space that was quiet and also free of decoration. So, for example, it's nice to be a, a nice quiet room. Somebody who has to keep covered. Let's give that as an example. A reasonable accommodation might be, let's say, for example, I had to have my body covered. I could allow someone, for example, to wear a sweatshirt or a long sleeve t-shirt underneath the polo shirt. That would be an example of a way to accommodate somebody else's requirements. So keep that in mind when you're writing this. You can use the religion of your choice. One of the things we talked about on Friday, we have to be cognizant of. Let's say, for example, I needed every Saturday off for my faith. We all work together. How many people are going to be happy that I'm the only guy getting every Saturday off? Yeah, nobody's raising their hand. How do we combat that? What are ways we can counteract that? Yes? You can give them flexible days. You could even do something as, as uh, simple as a shift differential to say if you're working the weekend, you get a little extra pay. Hey, believe you me, no matter where you go, somebody will take you up on that because somebody always needs the cash. So those are the kinds of things I'm asking you to consider when we get into this assignment. Uh, when I say one to two pages, if you can do it one page, be my guest. Guys, for any of you who, who managed to come to the presentation, I know some of you were in my previous class at all. What did you guys think? Any, any uh, reflection on meeting Dr. Uslan? Any reflection on the presentation? Did you guys enjoy it? Yeah, who, who was there? Raise your hand if you made it on Friday. I mean, will somebody tell me something that they enjoyed or learned from that? What, what did you enjoy most? Um, I thought it was interesting that um, he was doing, he was like starting out while he was doing stuff in college. Yeah, he was, he was a, what he said, a sophomore, I think, or a yeah. junior? crazy, and he was already getting into the world of United Artists and all that stuff. Any other observations? What else did you like or enjoy? Yes? I wasn't there, but was he as cool as you thought he was going to be? Yes, he was. Um, Corey, I can honestly tell you, that there's, what's the cliche about meeting your heroes? What, like, what do people always tell you if you're going to meet somebody you admire? Like, you know, 
They say, never meet your heroes. They won't be your heroes after you meet them. This guy was the real deal. He literally got here at 9.30 in the morning and hung the entire day. Like, he was so cool and so flexible. Uh, really just a, a great guy. And here's the thing that's crazy. He had to leave here. He literally left here to get to the Pittsburgh airport at 4 a.m. to be at the Joker premiere on Saturday. Like, that's that's who was here on Friday. Uh, it was crazy. We, we had, had fewer people than I was hoping for on Friday, but the people who were there got a show. Um, he actually was very approachable and very nice. I hope you had a chance to meet him. Uh, here's the other thing I'll tell you, too. He's saying that the Joker, this is a little off topic, but he's saying this Joker film is going to redefine superhero cinema the way the 89 film did and the way the Dark Knight did. And it already won a uh, prestigious film award in Milan, not as a superhero film, but as, a, a, as an art cinema kind of film. The only bad thing is some advanced... Uh, Media warnings are coming out saying that there are groups who are claiming they're going to shoot up movie theaters. So I would advise it against possibly seeing it the first weekend it's out. I'm not saying that I know anything that you guys don't. I know my wife and I are going to wait a weekend before we go see it. So people are crazy these days. Anything can happen. Terrible that that's the world we live in. And speaking of the world we live in and fuel for your nightmares, I'm just going to show a video on them, but I can't imagine the first generation of these are going to be cheap. So... Other thoughts. Well, you know, so this was moving paper. It was moving stuff around a construction site. And this was the small dog-sized version. But there are there are larger ones already in prototype and production. Why did I show this to an HR class? I'm talking about human resource management. I'm talking about managing people. Why did I show this to an HR class? Definitely, that's going to be part of our job. What else? What other kind of impact could this have on the human workforce? Yes. This is this is the first step, but is it conceivable that some repetitive functions could be replaced by machines that look like this? Is it like fun? A little bit off-putting, a little scary, too, a little terrifying. How many of you have ever watched Black Mirror? Have you, have you seen the episode about the dogs, the robot dogs? They're based on this design, actually, the idea that at some point the uh, the machines turn on their creators. I don't know that we're headed for a robot apocalypse of, uh, of robots coming and, and you know, mowing us down with machine guns. I think where the apocalypse comes from is that there are a lot of menial work that gets done now uh, by people is going to be done by machines. What do you guys think? Am I barking up the, the wrong tree, pun intended, or do you, do you agree or disagree? What are your thoughts? There's already a robot in California called Flippy that's making hamburgers. So it's already started. Thoughts? Jojo. Yeah. This is how the plot of every sci fi blockbuster starts. Yes. It is, from a technology standpoint, it is cool. And, and here's the point. I, I would rather be the master of this technology than having it, having it eliminate my job. If I were somebody in the construction industry, for example, I would be very concerned about this stuff. And they make larger ones that they're already experimenting with for military payload as well. Those are truly some nightmare fuel. I might show you a video of one of those in, the, uh, in, in a future class. They literally have these now that are the size of horses. And the United States military is experimenting with them for the idea of moving uh, packs and supplies through places like Afghanistan and Iraq. So uh, this is this is only the beginning. So you're welcome, guys. Guys, we started we left off talking about the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and our last point basically was if you are a larger employer, the, the thresholds for fines, the, the ceilings for fines get bigger. Bigger companies that discriminate pay more in fines, uh, both based on the fact that the government realizes that you can pay, you can afford to, and there's greater instances, uh, potentially, of discrimination, of violations of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This can range from anything like we were talking about with Chevron, a, a dirty email being sent to people and establishing a hostile work environment, to companies like Google. Google's been accused of not supporting females moving into management, for example. 
There was a big female walkout on Google about a year ago saying, we're not being allowed into the more technical parts of the operation. So even the bigger movers and shakers are being accused of this kind of discrimination. Guys, that's where affirmative action comes from. Affirmative action is a very controversial program. Some people are saying we should not be specifically reaching out to people who are members of protected classes. The intention of affirmative action is to set right the past wrongs. The reason we talk about the lessons of the past is the hope that we won't repeat them. So if you have an affirmative action program, it means that you're trying to reach out to people. Have you ever seen ads that say, say for example, uh, women and, and people of color particularly encouraged to employ or to, to apply? That's companies who are trying to reach out to more diverse demographics and get people into the companies. The objective of affirmative action is to increase diversity in our companies so we have less chance of being discriminatory. I think your generation's got a better shot at it than mine because you guys are more forward thinking. You, you've grown up in a more uh, diverse in, environment. I think what it really comes down to, my particular philosophy on this, if you hire the best candidates, you hire the best and brightest to come to your office and apply for these jobs, that's always a good defense. If you interview people, you treat them fairly, and you give everybody an equal shot at your job, that's a pretty good path forward. I'm not saying it'll always keep you free and clear, because sometimes things happen. I love the idea of anonymous applications, for example. We talked about this in one of the last classes. What is the benefit from a diversity standpoint of having an anonymous application, an application process with the person looking at your resume and your application can't see your name. What might be the advantage from a diversity standpoint? What do you think? Emily, what do you think? What would be the advantage? We're trying to make a more diverse workplace. Why would we not want to see somebody's name? Because Old start. If my last name were O'Malley, where would you assume I was from? Yeah, it's a very Irish sounding last name. The, the, yeah, seriously, it's, it's pretty darn Irish. Although the last name Tonkin is Asian, I cannot explain it. I'm not sure how it happened, but yet here I am. So it, you, you can never tell how this stuff is going to work out. My point is that you, if you have an anonymous application uh, procedure, you're going to have a better chance at getting diversity, or at least a better chance at not discriminating and keeping it out. You need to have a policy in your organization that basically says we're not going to discriminate and we're also going to have a zero tolerance policy for things like ethnic jokes or for racial slurs. That stuff has no place in society and certainly no place in our workplace in 2019. There's a lot of laws in particular to try to help out people uh, who are, are likely to experience sexual discrimination. Guys, let me ask you a question. Why do companies so often decide they're not going to hire somebody who's pregnant? It's against the law, but why would a company decide to do that? Yes? Well, the, the, we're going to be talking about the next Family Medical Leave Act, 12 weeks of leave. So let's say we've got somebody who's coming in the door. By the way, asking somebody if they are pregnant, even from a personal standpoint, is a bad decision. It will not work out in your favor. I did it once with an old alum friend of mine, somebody I graduated high school with, and found out, no, she wasn't pregnant. That was a uh, awkward conversation for all of us. Don't ever ask somebody, even if they're a friend, if they're expecting, let them tell you, please, follow my advice here. Yes, it was a face palm moment. But the point is, if you uh, are hiring somebody who's expecting, one of the reasons that people who are pregnant get discriminated against is, why should I hire this person? By the time I get them in the office and do their paperwork, they're going to be going out on medical leave doesn't matter. You cannot discriminate against somebody from being pregnant. Somebody who is pregnant is considered to have a serious medical condition, and they're covered under the Family Medical Leave Act. Here's the other trick in the United States, guys. How many days of legally required paid leave do employee, employers, let me rephrase that, how many days of, of paid leave are employers required to give employees in the United States? A big fat zero. You are not required to give your employees a day off. You're required to pay them overtime. You're required to give them time and a half. You are not required to get paid days off. How many, by the way, how many of you think that that's fair? Do you think we should have legally mandated days off? What are your thoughts? So, you think so? Yeah, I think we should. Yeah, 
that. We we don't do our best work when we're working seven days a week. What do you think? It's true. There's some jobs that people got to work on the holidays, too. I, I, I guess my counterpoint would be, I think that we run into some public health issues with not giving days off, too. How could, not, how could people not getting days off result in public hazards? If I don't get a day off, no matter what, how could I be a hazard to you guys? What do you think? Yes. Exactly. So if I get the, you know, whatever version of the St. Francis plague we get this year that's working through every damn dormitory, and I come in here and I'm coughing and spitting all over you guys because I don't get a paid day off, it's not going to do you any favors. Well, imagine somebody who works in food service who is not paying attention uh, to what's going in your food, or somebody who works in healthcare. But the bottom line is we do not get any required paid time off. That's where the Family Medical Leave Act comes in. Here's the way it works. It does not require employers to give you paid time off. It does require your employer to say, if you're a full-time employee and you worked 1,080 hours in the last year, you're required to get 12 weeks of unpaid leave if you have a serious medical condition. Now, that can mean I'm sick, my kid's sick, my spouse is sick, my parents are sick, my wife is pregnant. Any of those can apply. Now, let's say, for example, you know, God forbid, I broke my leg and I, I, I invoked FMLA. St. Francis could require me to take my vacation and sick time as part of that 12 weeks, so I would have an income, but they are required under law to give me that 12 weeks off and have a job for me when I get back. Now, here's the trick. That, that lady who's pregnant who we just hired, technically, we are not required to give her FMLA if she has not worked the requisite number of hours. So, if you don't give her time off, technically, you're not breaking the law. If she's been a full-time employee there, you, you are. That being said, if somebody just comes into your company and you're denying her time off for a pregnancy, how long is that person probably going to stick with your company? That person's going to be, you know, filing resumes on their way to deliver the baby. It's not going to work out all that well. And then we get into something called the Equal Pay Act. You would think after this, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, we'd have had this crap behind us. But we still have other legislation that says if men and women are doing the same job, they should get paid the same. I decided to, I did some research just to see where we are in terms of the, the pay gap. And I'm going to be presenting some up-to-date statistics for you. Some of it was very surprising to me. We also have the concept of pay equity. That means that if you're doing the same job, whether you're male or female, whether you're black or white, whether you're old or young, we should be paid the same for doing the same job. So if somebody comes in and they're doing the same job as somebody who's already been there, with the exception of something like a collective bargaining agreement for anybody in my union class, if, you are being, if you're being paid to do a job, it should be similar or, or comparable to somebody else. You shouldn't get different pay just based on a characteristic such as your color, your skin, or your gender. And the reason we enforce this is because we have a continued pay gap. Now, this is out of our text. Uh, I don't want you to concentrate on this slide. I'm more interested in the coming slide. Right now, the uncontrolled pay gap. And that means right now, if you took every woman and every man in the United States, what are they making? All professions, all levels of skill, everything else. Women right now are making about 79 cents for every dollar that a man makes. That's what we refer to as the uncontrolled pay gap. Now, that's, it's, the good news is it's gone up. Since 2015, we've gone up, you know, about five cents. But the, the bigger number is what we refer to as the controlled pay gap. What that means if you compare people in, in similar situations. So if we've got, for example, Sarah and I work for the same company doing the same job, we're both professionals, the pay gap has decreased. So we're actually to about 90, 98 cents out of $1 for every female who's in the same profession as men. What this really paints the picture, actually let me ask you, what, what picture does this paint? If we're so close on the professional pay gap in terms of 98 cents to $1, why do we still have such a significant pay gap in the uncontrolled for all professions? What does this indicate? Yes? Exactly right. So we have more people. Women tend to, if there's a stay-at-home parent, although that's starting to change, it tends to be females. There's one other aspect to it. you got half the equation. What's the other half? 
Any guesses? Yes. More women are doing probably lower paid or unskilled labor jobs. For example, if you go to fast food, if you go to house cleaning services, and I, there's nothing wrong with those professions. It's honorable to work. But those folks tend to make lower wages. I don't think I've ever, in all my years of traveling for work, I don't think I've ever seen a man cleaning a hotel room. And I think that a lot of women still find themselves in lower wage jobs. And the other thing, too, what happens if you're a female and you have children and you take 10 years out of the workforce when you re-enter? What happens? What's different? Yeah, everything. Everything's different. Can you imagine, like, today, if you said, at this moment in time, I am going to remove myself from my education, I'm going to remove myself from work, and I'm going to position myself in the home to raise kids, which, by the way, is also honorable. There's nothing wrong with that. You're missing out on everything else that's happening around you. It's harder to get back into the workplace, and you're not going to come back with equivalent skills to people who've been there the whole time. Now, here's a trivia question for you. There's one female demographic where skilled females are making more per hour than skilled males. What would you guess? Well, no, I'm thinking actually, it's a good guess. I'm thinking actually uh, an ethnicity. What would you guess? There's a certain ethnic group that's making more money for females than educated males. Any guesses? Take a guess. That's exactly right. Right now, Asian females are making $1.01 for every dollar that men make in the United States. And considering, considering guys, uh, the Asians are the smallest demographic subgroup in the United States, that is saying something. So the, these folks are definitely finding their ways into really good professional positions. Interesting stuff. So, guys, in terms of ways that we can reduce inequities, I think the biggest one is just basically, number one, to hire people based on their qualifications. Be ethical. Be good to people. Have, have a company that supports people getting promotions. That's number one. But these are other rules, too. I, I've always been brought up in, a, in a, a society and environment where people did not talk about their wages. Should we talk to other people about what we make? Should other people, should we know what people pull down in terms of salary? Should, should we know what our coworkers make? What are your thoughts? Is that a good or a bad idea? What do you think, Corey? Um, I think to an extent, like, not talking about it kind of just helps the employee because, like, if they I don't know if someone else is making more than me for the same job, then I wouldn't really say something about it or anything like that. But, I mean, it could also be something like if you want to keep private, you know, which is another thing. It's funny how it works because you're absolutely right. It's at the employer's advantage. If the employer is the only one who knows what everybody's making, at some extent, they can continue the same practices they've been doing. They can, and if it's discriminatory, they can do it too. What, you hear things that you should talk about what money you make. Who here doesn't want to know what the co is? Tell me why. Because you are Well, it, it could possibly go the other direction too, though. Let's say, for example, Richard and I work for the same company. Richard hustles, man. He works hard. I, I don't work as hard as he does. And at the end of the day, I find out, Richard, how much more an hour are you making than I do? Uh, let's see, let's make it four. He's making four bucks an hour more than I am. That could have one of two effects on me. The first effect could be, wow, this is demoralizing to me. Richard's making so much more money. But if I'm realistic about it and say, wow, Richard works a lot harder than I do, Maybe if I work that hard, I can get to where he's at. So transparency is a big issue. If you work for Amazon, for example, their internal uh, performance management structure allows you to see everybody, uh, every other manager's performance data and their paychecks. So you can see what they're making compared to you. I think that having some level of transparency means you're telling people how high they have to perform to get the raise. Has anybody here, for example, in their personal experience, ever worked a job where they didn't think they were being paid fairly and they didn't know how to get a raise. You ever been in that situation where it was ambiguous? Richard, tell me about it. Is 
It's going to be very demoralizing, can't it? It's, it's, a great, it's a great analogy, and it fits perfectly. Guys, let me give you an example of, of where I think an appropriate degree of transparency sits. If you wanted to know all the assignments in this class, how you were evaluated, in terms of what percentages counted towards your grade, how could you find that out? Yeah, go on Canvas, go on to the syllabus. It's very clearly laid out. Here's how you get an A in my class. You have to do well on these things. It should be the same deal in pay. You can do these things, and you'll get a promotion. You can do these things and you get an hourly raise. This is where you'll max out your pay grade. The other thing we should always be doing is going back and seeing, are we being fair? Are we auditing our own procedures and making sure that we are fairly enforcing our own rules? That all applies the same. Otherwise, we end up producing these things, guys. Who here has ever heard of the term the glass ceiling? What's it mean? We say somebody's got a glass ceiling. What does that mean? Yeah, it's like a glass ceiling. It's kind of like, I walk back here, and it's so nice out there today, man. Look at it. It's beautiful. What is it, about 80 degrees out there? And I can see it. It's so close. If I hit the window, I can't quite get to it. I can leave fingerprints on the window for somebody to clean. I can't quite get to it. I can see it. It's taunting me. It's kind of like if I were staring through this window right now, looking at a fresh, extra-large pizza pie with all the meats on it, and I just can't get to it. And it's frustrating because you can see it, and everybody's telling you you can have it, but you really can't get it. That's why they call it the glass ceiling. It has disproportionately affected people of color and females in the United States. Then we have what we refer to as glass elevators. It means, for example, we'll let some females get into management in certain departments, but we're not going to let them everywhere. Guys, can somebody tell me an industry that's very female-dominated? Generally speaking. Healthcare, very good answer. Because, for example, if you if you compare male to female nurses, there's plenty of male nurses now, but it's still female dominated. Education is another such place. If you go to Google, most female developers are doing things like graphics and front end work. For those of you who do technology, you find very few females on the programming side. So those are examples of glass elevators. And then we get a concept called the glass cliff. Has anybody ever heard of that? Guys, look it up. I encourage you to do so. You may even do so now if you have your computer or your phone. The glass cliff means that women are more likely to be promoted into management when a company is falling apart. We saw it with General Motors. Who's the, does anybody know who the CEO of General Motors is? Mary Barra. She's the first female CEO of an American car company in the history of the automobile business. So we got Mary Barra who's promoted in. She got promoted in right around 2011, 2012. What was GM just crawling out of at that point? During that period of time. General Motors. What were we just coming out of in this country? We got it. So she inherited a car company that was in arguably some of the worst shape we'd ever seen a car company, and she turned it around. Has anybody ever heard of Margaret Thatcher? Who's Margaret Thra Thatcher? She was the first female prime minister of Great Britain. I think she was, she's been only the one of, the first of two. Theresa May was the last one. She got elected in the 1980s and inherited the worst economy in the history of Great Britain, and she turned it around. Not everybody liked her. She was tough. They called her the Iron Lady. She was really tough. Uh, she was a very conservative, staunch kind of person, but she was tough. But when it ended up in these positions, so many times, whenever things are going poorly, why does that happen, guys? Why, in your opinion, is it more likely for women to get promoted into management when, when the blankets hit the fan? What are your thoughts? I have a theory, but I want to know yours. Yeah, so we're saying, well, let's try the Hail Mary pass. Since, uh, you know, no pun intended with the female reference, because nothing else has worked. Yes? I agree with you. Tell me more.
I, I also agree that with the, the millennials at the start, and I hope Gen Z creates a thing for I want to see equality in the workplace. But what else? Is there another reason to be millennials? Yes. Um, it's going to be like it comes on Bailey Stone and he's like, you know what, we're just giving them a shot. Let's do something similar. Yeah, how, we're already having problems. What, what worse can we do? Go ahead. Yeah, because all the, all the male executives have already gone out the door. I think you guys all have really good answers for this. I want to ask you all a question. You just had the shittiest day of your life. Everything has gone sour today. And you have one phone call to make today. You can call one person and talk about it. Who are you calling? Raise your hand if your mom would be your first phone call. I think there's something to that. Moms can fix anything. I'm not saying it's right, and I don't mean it as a sexist statement. I mean it in the back of our psychology. No matter what culture you go to, no matter where you go in the world, moms occupy a very specific position that they can fix everything. And I, I think that's got to be part of the psychological subtext to this. So in terms of where the, where the glass ceilings are hardest to break through, guys, some industries we're doing okay. We're doing okay in healthcare. We're doing okay in education. What are the tough industries for, for women to break through? I've already mentioned tech. Can you guess another? I'm sorry? Yeah, Detroit definitely in terms of the car business. You're absolutely correct. Where else? You got engineering, so the science field, yes. Definitely all male dominated industries. How about finance? Do you know in, in the United States, and I'm quoting a statistics off, off the top of my head, I'll, I'll, I'll verify it. If you went to all the, the big finance firms in New York City, the people who, who do trades, the people who are trying to make money for Wall Street, all those firms, out of all of them, what percentage of those firms have female managers? Of all the employees who work in finance, or all, all the, the, the companies in finance, what percentage of them have females who are primarily in management? If you're a Fortune 500 company, you're trading on Wall Street. Yeah, it's about 15 to 5, depending on where you go. It's a low percentage. It's a very male-dominated industry. And I think that should change. I think if we, if we mentor people, and by the way, I hope you've all been hearing the, rum hearing the rumblings. We're going to be talking about mentorship week uh, that's coming up. Guys, mentorship's important. What, what does a mentor do for you, guys? What does a mentor do for you if you're coming into the professional world? Shows you the ropes. Teaches you how to get around. Mentorship programs are great for females to get them into, into management, for example. And if you've got people, for example, who are underrepresented demographically, why not? You should also be tracking, are we losing or keeping our female managers? And we also should think about alternative work arrangements. What I'm talking about there, in the United States, more and more people are having children without being married, or they're having children after the divorce, and it's not limited to just females. There's plenty of males out there who are also single parents. Before I go forth, guys, I would like to take a pause for our first question of the day. What are you dying to ask? Question about anything, or I will randomly call on some. Sir. Please. Do I have a bucket list? Yeah, I do, actually. Oh, boy, I don't, I don't know if it would be the top, but I hope we get to do it someday. I've always wanted to do a cross-country uh, motorcycle. I, uh, I'd love to start my uh, my bike where I actually can touch the Atlantic Ocean and ride the whole way across the country with my foot in the Pacific Ocean and do it all on the motorcycle. I, I, I wanted to do that before I was 40 and I missed that boat. Uh, I need a bigger bike. I need something that's a little more reliable to do it. Uh, probably won't happen until after uh, I, I start getting close to retirement. I still hope I get to do that. What about you? Is there something on your bucket list? For real, that would be awesome. That's, that is no joke either. Have you read about why all these people died last year? Too many people trying to get to the top at the same time. They, they max out the systems and stuff. That's, I mean, that's no joke. That's something that you, you train for for a lifetime. If you get to do it, that would be amazing. Does anybody else have a bucket list? Though? There's something you want to accomplish before you die. 
What do you think? Yes. That's a good goal, man, just to go. Just to go. Who else has a bucket list? Item? Seriously, guys, chime in here. What's your life goal? What's that? Does anybody else have one they want to share? I see some encouragement happening here in the back. Like, what What, what are your bucket lists, guys? Tell her her husband's a loser, he's not going anywhere. Yeah, he's that guy can barely pay the rent. I mean, Jay Z, he's he's uh, he's going under, man. Seriously, it's good to have goals. It's good to have goals. Anybody else have a bucket list? Yes. Yeah, where well you get to experience weightlessness. That would be amazing. I, I support your life goal. Anybody else? So we got meeting Beyonce, we got Zero G Flight, we got Fiji, we got Everest. That's a great goal. What one or two more? Anybody else have a life goal they want to share? Yes. Like uh, is you have any any particular list of, of countries? Good goal. You know, it's it's funny. Uh, we had a, st a student, Stephanie, who graduated last year. He's in the Peace Corps, and she's going to be living in a few different places. So it, that's very doable. One more. One more goal. Anybody have a goal they want to share? The motorcycle ride is mine. It's a very small goal, but I hope I get to do it. So these are all good things, guys. As I mentioned in the last class, sexual orientation is not a federally protected criteria, but about 18 to 20 states have either passed or, or are in the process of passing similar legislation. Guys, give me your undivided attention for 10 more minutes. We're talking about basically at a federal level, we do not have any protection for people who practice a quote-unquote alternative life, lifestyle. At this point, if you go under Title VII, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it applies to your gender as to what is on your birth certificate. If you are Caitlyn Jenner, for example, you are still considered by law to be a male, regardless if you have surgery or not. So that is something we may see change in the, in the coming years. Guys, one of the other things that also is a concept when we talk about sexual harassment and harassment in the workplace, we're talking about nepotism. Who here has ever heard of that term? It means hiring your family. Guys, please, up front. Nepotism means you're hiring people you're related to. You're showing favoritism. How can that be a problem, guys? Why is nepotism a problem in the workplace? Anybody have a guess? Ian, why is nepotism a problem in the workplace? I'm not hiring the most of So if I'm Ian's cousin, for example, I'm slacking off at the job and Aaron's working hard and I'm getting more money per hour than she is, it's because of nepotism. He's doing me a solid because I'm his cousin. And then we get into the idea of workplace romance. That's the next level. Guys, if anybody wants to say that people shouldn't date other people at the office, it's a wonderful idea, but does it really work in practice? Why do people always end up in office romances? Go ahead. It's, it's true. <laughs> a very, very apt summary. The bottom line, guys, you're going to spend more time around people you work with than your own family. They are risky. And here's where they get risky, guys. If you've got somebody who is having a romantic relationship who is not on the same level as them in the company, if you're dating somebody who's conceivably your boss, number one, you're in a position where somebody has considerable power over you. Number two, you're also in a position, for example, to receive very favorable treatment. So think about this stuff. This can very quickly go into what we refer to as sexual harassment or harassment depending on how you pronounce the term. It basically means if you're getting any kind of contact or conduct that's unwanted and sexual in nature. It does not have to be a physical touch. If somebody is saying things repeatedly that you do not enjoy being, in a way not, you do not enjoy being spoken to, it can also happen between people who work at your company and people who don't. 
if you work in customer service and one of your employees is making lewd comments to people coming to the counter, that's still sexual harassment even though those people do not work for you. It can be male or female, it can be boss or subordinate, and it goes unreported in many ways because people are afraid of retaliation and they're also uh, intimidated into not doing so. We've got two main types, guys. Quid pro quo, that's a Latin term. Does anybody know what it means? Quid is this, the word this. This for that, that's what quid pro quo means. If you do this for me, you'll get that promotion. If you do this for me, you're gonna get that hourly raise. There was a very famous case involving a Hollywood icon that spawned an entire movement. Who was that Hollywood icon who was sexually harassing uh, all these actresses with quid pro quo harassment? Who am I thinking? Weinstein, yep, Harvey Weinstein. He's basically telling people, you want a career, you're gonna do these things with me. So it comes down to, generally speaking, uh, superiors uh, promote this. The idea of somebody saying you can do this to get a raise or I'm going to make a decision on promotion. The company is responsible regardless if it was an individual action. If all this stuff goes unchecked, you can end up what we refer to as a hostile work environment. For example, the joke that got sent out over email at, uh, at uh, Chevron created a hostile work environment because we were showing that we tolerated dirty jokes. We tolerated racial or ethnic slurs. We tolerated things that are not good for the environment uh, that we worked in. Let me give you an example. In the old days, it was very common to walk into a garage. In the garage, mechanics typically are what gender? Typically male. Not always, but typically. It was very common to walk in those areas and see a swimsuit or nude calendars in those, those places. A female who comes into that environment may not want to see that stuff in the work environment. So that's, cre that's created a hostile work environment if it's not resolved. It happens all the time. In terms of the things that are breeding sexual harassment these days, well, first is gender stereotyping. And that is, the guys are always going to be in control and the women are going to be subordinates. We have that issue and we have a toxic culture in some companies. And then we get into the, the complications of the 21st century, namely that everybody's got a cell phone, everybody's friends on social media, and it doesn't always go away after the workday. These are basically things that we should not be doing in the workplace. It's stuff that you would think that you could assume people would have common sense, but if you think about the people who've been brought down by these kinds of issues, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of the most unfortunately named politician in the history of politicians. Who am I thinking of? The very fact that this guy uh, was, was sending na naked pictures of himself to female interns and the congressman's name was Anthony Weiner means the joke just writes itself. <laughs> I mean, I, th that's serious. You guys have not heard about this? This guy was a congressman and was sending naked pictures of himself to, to female pages and other people in Congress, and his name was Anthony Weiner. It's as bad as Bernie Madoff being a guy, like literally, the guy's name is Bernie Madoff, and he's running a pyramid scheme. So we've got to have policies these days that, that, that outline what's appropriate and what isn't in terms of social media, because we're all so damn connected these days, guys. And depending where you live, uh, the tolerances can vary. Different cultures have different ideas on this stuff. The bottom line is you, you've, you've got to make sure you've got a policy and that you actually enforce it, the message you're sending. If somebody gets harassed and they go to the HR to report it, nothing gets done, or even worse, the harassment gets worse or they get retaliated against, what message are you sending to the other people in your company? What's the message? Yes. Yeah, we, we don't care. We're not going to do anything about it. No, by the way, you just made it worse by reporting. So we can't have that. Your company's got to have ethics, number one. We've got to have a real policy. We've got to communicate it to people every year. And sometimes that training gets a little annoying. I'll admit that, too. But we've got to get the word out about it. And also, sometimes people come from different walks of life. I want you to think, for example... The difference between talking to a professor at a university, I'm using this as my personal life example, when I go to a family reunion and I'm in the backyard talking to one of my uncles, for example, what they see as acceptable speech as a 65 or 70 year old man might be different than what would be tolerated in an office setting. 
If you've got a multicultural workplace, you've got a multi-generational workplace, guys, you may be working with people up to 65 or 70 years old. What they saw as acceptable in their generation is not necessarily acceptable anymore. So if you've got older managers, you may have to train them. And the other point of this is if you've got an issue, you got to investigate it when you get it. We're going to be picking up on Wednesday with this discussion. I'm going to ask you to consider this before we get into Wednesday. Is dating in the workplace acceptable? Yes or no? Have a wonderful day, guys. Hey, for anybody who was traveling...